In the darkness of the underground dungeon, Hillis stood before a red-haired man whose words seemed to swirl in the air. He addressed her not with a request, but with a demand that she sacrifice her life instead of Gabrielle's. Emotions rippled in her eyes, where love and doubt were intertwined. Guy insisted that this might be the only way to save Gabrielle. Hillis felt the responsibility for someone else's life weigh heavily on her shoulders. She glanced up at him, her gaze flickering with inner turmoil. In the shadows of the underground dungeon, Hillis stood before her older brother, the red-haired fellow known as Dear Mr. Rose, Ricardo Inouaden. His gaze carried not only the bond of family ties, but also the influence he held among his followers. Hillis, handcuffed and sitting behind bars, her eyes reflected disbelief at the words her brother had just spoken. Her heart, into which he had mercilessly thrust his thorns, shattered. Every word he spoke seemed like oppression, a dark shadow consuming the last vestige of hope. Through the bars she could see his face, familiar but at this moment alien, cold and indifferent. The handcuffs became a symbol not only of her physical imprisonment, but also of the captivity she felt inside, a captivity in the family bonds where her brother had become the sinister enforcer of her fate. At that moment, Ricardo burst into a tirade full of conviction about the inevitability of fate. He argued fervently that Gabrielle, in his opinion, was too weak a girl to withstand the confinement of the dungeon. His words were like the tip of an invisible blade piercing the air and hitting Hillis in the heart. Through the bars, she listened to his speech, relying on every word as if it might shed light on the weaving of dark intrigues into which her family ties drew her. Severely upset, Hillis, sitting in chains and looking at her brother through the bars, could not contain her emotions. Her questions were filled with worry and despair as she began to ask if it would be okay for him if she died. The words seemed to reflect her internal battle between her own life and what she considered an integral part of her family. Ricardo's words hit Hillis like a cold downpour. He claimed as if she herself had bragged that she was already experiencing her life for the seventh time. This information, like an icy stream, penetrated her consciousness. She felt as if the vortex of time was pulling her back into the past again. At that moment, a mixture of surprise and disbelief left only one question on Hillis's lips. Would she return to the past again? as the lace of fate began to intertwine for the eighth time. With a sad face, Hillis asked how appropriate it was to remember her peculiarity. In response, Ricardo stated without any warmth that if she did head into the past, then it would be worth nothing for her to die in Gabrielle's place. It wasn't just his words that resounded in that moment, but the weight of the realization that her brother's life was being placed above her own, Hillis's tears dripped onto the cold stone as she pondered why such cruel words could have come from Ricardo's so beautiful lips. Pain and incomprehension stole into each of her teardrops as to how such ruthless phrases could have been born out of their familial bond. This sudden contrast between her brother's outward beauty and his emotionless remarks seemed to shock her, as if it revealed untraveled facets of his character. In her moment of weakness and vulnerability, his words struck sharply like an invisible dagger, making her wonder how much she knew her own brother. She couldn't bear to ask her brother how he could say such words, given that he'd been dismissive of her all his life. He'd called her words nonsense, and her stories about her seventh life just a way to get attention. Her question was not only painful in its frankness, but also disbelief in the bond she'd always thought she shared with her brother. Her words were like a last cry in the hope of unraveling the eyes of a loved one, who seemed more mysterious than the dungeons that surrounded them. Ricardo remained silent, showing no interest in freeing Hillis from the dungeon. This strange nonchalance stood in stark contrast to the things she had done all her life for her brother, including taking on Gabriel's crime. Even with such displays of devotion, her older brother had not raised his hand to help her. Her whole life had been devoted to taking care of Ricardo, but now that she was in trouble, he preferred to remain silent. Hillis felt all illusions of familial affection deceptively shattered. It was incredible to realize that all her devotion to her brother had run into a wall of indifference. After all, Hillis had even taken on the crimes of Gabrielle, the girl whose dark deeds had become a shadow over her fate. She couldn't believe that Ricardo preferred to remain silent even as she carried his burden on her shoulders. Hillis leaned against the bars and turned to Ricardo, trusting that the blood ties would make him at least a little softer. Why are you doing this to me, Ricardo? 
Her voice sounded weak, but there was a plea for understanding in it. She was his little sister, too, after all, just like Gabrielle. However, in response to her words, Ricardo hit the bars in a rage, making a sharp sound and shouted, accusing Hillis of thinking only of herself. A barrage of anger-filled words flew into Hillis's face as if she was the target for all the anger that had accumulated. You think only of yourself, Ricardo thundered. He argued that Hillis deserved to die instead of their little sister, Gabrielle. The words were like a blow to Hillis's heart, throwing her into an abyss of pain and incomprehension. Instead of support from her brother, she received only accusation and rage, and her pleading gaze was lost in the merciless darkness of his eyes. Hillis retorted that she was unable to commit such a desperate act. Ricardo, like a broken man, fell on his knees, begging her. His eyes expressed not only fear of loss but also hopelessness before the difficult share they shared. Lowering his head with a sad expression, Ricardo whispered that this was his only plea. Hillis, knowing that she was living her life for the seventh time, felt the weight of those words. He was begging her to go back in time, to change the course of events, to bring everything back to the beginning. Leaning toward him, Ricardo looked at Hillis with eyes full of hidden longing. He said that death was but a moment, and that it was nothing to be endured. These words were emphasized by the invisible weight of his pain and fear of loss. Ricardo's gaze seemed to plead with her to sacrifice herself despite her doubts and agony. Ricardo's words pierced Hillis like a sharp blade. She couldn't realize that her own brother, a blood relative, could make such a terrible recommendation only to endure death. It was too much, even for a man who had lived his life seven times. Ricardo, rising again, urged Hillis to reflect on the misfortune that had befallen their unfortunate Gabrielle. He reminded her that she herself, Hillis, had endured that misery seven times already. This glimpse into the past, with its shadow of betrayal and pain, seemed to pierce Hillis's heart, making her choice all the more difficult. Ricardo, expressing his ignorance of Hillis's previous lives, argued that perhaps she should have gotten used to death as an inevitable part of her existence. In his eyes, it seemed as if death should be something commonplace and even habitual for her. Suddenly, however, Hillis, going through agonizing experiences and unbelievable circumstances, laughed lightly. It became clear to her how unfair it was that she, Ricardo's own sister, was the one in such a tragic position. She wondered why someone who didn't share a bloodline with them, Gabrielle, deserved his love and attention more than Hillis, who had been with them all along. This feeling of injustice and meaninglessness made her wonder what was going on in their complicated fates. Ricardo, expressing his ignorance of Hillis's previous lives, argued that perhaps she should have gotten used to death as an inevitable part of her existence. In his eyes, it seemed as if death should be something commonplace and even habitual for her. Suddenly, however, Hillis, going through agonizing experiences and unbelievable circumstances, laughed lightly. It became clear to her how unfair it was that she, Ricardo's own sister, was the one in such a tragic position. She wondered why someone who didn't share a bloodline with them, Gabrielle, deserved his love and attention more than Hillis, who had been with them all along. This feeling of injustice and meaninglessness made her wonder what was going on in their complicated fates. The seventh failure of misfortune had confirmed in Hillis the conviction that Ricardo was an inherent scoundrel to the very end, and now it was her time to repay him. For the eighth time, surrounded by the shadows of her previous lives, Hillis once again returned to a familiar time where all those tragic events unfolded. She found herself in a past filled with tears and pain, determined to right and change the wrongs that had been done before. This was her eighth chance to rewrite her destiny, and Hillis intended to use it with the utmost determination. The daylight did not diminish the eeriness of what was unfolding in this ominous play. Under the expansive, bright skylight, the demonic creature still gaped, creating darkness and chaos all around. Once again, as in the previous eight lives, Ricardo was rushing to Gabrielle's aid, bypassing Hillis. He was once again becoming her protector, ignoring his sister. This moment was like a set piece repeated in every act of her life, and Hillis realized the challenge of facing this unfair performance over and over again. This persistent reality, where her brother didn't seem to notice her suffering, became a kind of shadow that haunted her in every life. 
Left alone with a monster that has literally opened its maw before her, Hillis is plunged into a darkness of helplessness. She feels the weight of darkness upon her, knowing that this monster is a symbol of her own struggles and tragedies. At the end of his previous life, Ricardo promised that this time he would save her first. Once again, however, Irony laughs at Hillis when it is Gabrielle who once again comes to his rescue. This cruel paradox causes Hillis to laugh bitterly with a mixture of resentment and despair. She is alone in her struggle with darkness, and her laughter becomes a kind of escape from this hopeless situation where the script seems written on her suffering. The eyes of the servants and Ricardo were filled with absolute fear as the fiendish monster prepared to eclipse its horror. Their souls shuddered with the anticipation of imminent tragedy, their hearts beat faster in time with the threat, and their eyes, riveted with terror, were turned toward Hillis. At that moment, they realized that they were witnessing the worst possible finale. However, before the monster could capitalize on its sinister intent, Hillis, as if conducting a magical symphony, summoned the magical vines winding around the sinister monster. Now he stood before her like a prisoner, the web of magic entangling him in its spells. Hillis, undaunted, glanced at her family and servants as if to flip the script, if only for a moment. Her face expressed equanimity in the face of danger, and in that moment her power to rewrite her own fate was on full display, causing all those around her to freeze in wonder and amazement before her. Hillis was standing right in front of Ricardo, her gaze indomitable determination. She said without blinking that his actions were something truly terrible. She reminded him of how he had begged her to be alone with the monster, leaving her to her fate. At this point, Gabrielle, with a face tear-stained with fear and anxiety, expressed her feelings. She confessed that she was afraid. However, Hillis, only increasing her contempt, rebuked Gabrielle. Hillis told her that the fear was her own fault since Gabrielle was the one who had expressed her desire to meet a monster, claiming that it was currently in vogue. Hillis looked at Gabrielle reproachfully, like a cranky girl who was playing with fire by declaring her desire to get a closer look at the monster. Ricardo, disagreeing with Hillis's accusations and defending Gabrielle, said it was cruel to accuse her at a time like this when she was in a state of shock. To this, Hillis simply dismissed his words and passed on with a weary look. She only remarked that she had always known that Ricardo was an intolerable man and that it was better to keep him out of her sight. Her words sounded like the last chord in their complicated history and Hillis left, leaving behind her a cloud of implacability and disappointment. Hillis belongs to an ancient Inidan family whose power is waning, and now there is only one receiver of the power in each generation. She looked out the window at her brother, thinking that no matter what he did, he would not inherit that power until she was dead. Evening came, and in the quiet room, Gabrielle was still sobbing, her tears falling gently like raindrops in the dark sea of her grief. Ricardo, standing nearby, tried to put a comforting hand on her, fumbling for the pulse of her pain. However, the moment the clouds of hope seemed to begin to dissipate, Gabrielle abruptly pulled out of his caring embrace. You forgot about me! Her voice sounded like lightning, revealing long-buried resentments. Ricardo, startled by the unexpected attack, tried to unravel Gabrielle's puzzled agitation. She reproached him with the fact that during the day when the monster had overtaken them with its terror, all his fear and care had been confined to Hillis, while she herself had had to face the nightmare unprotected. The sudden sound of the lock clicking shattered the tension in the room like a break in a symphony of momentary emotions. The figure of their father, Diego, appeared in the doorframe. Gabrielle, as if she had forgotten everything, threw herself into his arms where she found comfort and safety. Diego, for his part, was slightly relieved to see that none of his children had been hurt in the chaos that had erupted in their home. The mixture of the joy of being reunited with a loved one and the tension of the upcoming conversations created an atmosphere where emotions swirled like swirls of wind before a thunderstorm. Diego, feeling involuntarily relieved, knew that there was a clarification to be made, but at first it was more important to emphasize that all his children were unharmed. Ricardo, with a face as if forged of stone, suddenly dropped a piece of news that changed the tense atmosphere of the room. He said that there was a kind of blossoming in the hillies, an awakening of long-awaited family strength. Diego, raising his eyebrows in disbelief, could not believe such a thing. He argued that perhaps it was Ricardo who had become possessed of new magical powers, 
and that would be a pleasant surprise. Ricardo, however, with a shadow of sadness in his eyes, refuted these assumptions. He said that the magical vines that had enveloped the monster that day had followed Hillis's every move, like magical threads that bound her to her family heritage. Diego shuddered in surprise and misunderstanding as he realized that events around his family were taking a surprising turn. Diego, offended and indignant, reminded Ricardo that only one person in the family was destined to awaken the family power. He was convinced that this power should belong to Ricardo, as the eldest member of the family. In response to this assertion, Ricardo silently bowed his head, saying nothing in his defense. Diego, realizing that his son wasn't going to argue or justify himself, only sighed with a fair amount of fatigue. He announced that he would deal with Hillis himself tomorrow, as if preparing for a difficult test that could change the course of the family dynamic. At this point, tension hung in the room, as if storm clouds were gathering over the future of the Inoidans. The next morning, Hillis, determined and ready for any challenge, appeared in the dining room for lunch. But the frightened servants, with looks filled with fear, informed her that orders had been given to prepare breakfast for only three members of the family, and her presence was not intended. Nevertheless, Hillis resolutely sat down at the table, causing the servants even deeper consternation. Screaming and begging, the servants began to assert that the dish was for Diego, the head of the family. But Hillis did not falter or retreat. Her determination to fight for her place in the family was evident even in the way she broke the rules by eating her breakfast. The servants kept shouting in desperation, warning her that food would be brought to her room. But Hillis did not let herself be intimidated. Her determined act was a sign of the changes that were coming to the Inuaden house. Hillis, staunchly maintaining her right to be at the table, flatly refused to leave. She declared that she would eat here and now, leaving this meal only when she had finished. This steadfastness surprised even the servants, who had encountered such resistance for the first time. Hillis ate slowly and attentively, as if enjoying every bite, and her unusual behavior irritated and panicked the servants. Yet in Hillis herself, hiding her emotions, a long-forgotten need for a normal meal was awakening. Her thoughts fled to the past, to a time when the dark shadows of the dungeon had surrounded her and she had long been unable to savor a cooked meal. Now she resolutely resisted the storm of memories, eager to reclaim her place in her family and find normalcy in her life. The taste of breakfast brought her not only physical satisfaction, but also emotional peace. This simple meal, perceived by many as an ordinary event, had become for Hillis a symbol of freedom. She had been deprived of it in prison, and now, sitting at the table in the family castle, she couldn't help but feel grateful for every delicious bite. Finally, when breakfast was over, Hillis rose from the table with confidence in her words. She expressed her gratitude for the food she had prepared, hinting that to her even simple pleasures, such as a proper breakfast, were something of value. With the strength and dignity that her words carried, she confidently asked that she no longer be humiliated by second-rate food. This moment was another step toward Hillis regaining her dignity and her place in the ancestral home. The maid, on hearing the words second-rate food, pitched forward in a whirlwind of misunderstanding and excitement. However, when she heard that Hillis was not going to endure the humiliation any longer, the maid involuntarily admitted her guilt, leaving with the words that she had noticed that she was being fed with leftovers from the table and would not allow herself to do so in the future. When the servants left, Hillis exited the dining room and ran into Diego and Ricardo heading inside. They were discussing how to ask the chef to make Gabrielle her favorite cake, hoping to lift her spirits and stop her sadness. At that moment, seeing how much the family cared for her little sister, Hillis realized that she now had not only her own future in her hands, but also the ability to influence family relationships. Noticing Hillis in the dining room, Diego expressed his disappointment and poked her with his gaze, demanding an explanation. He was uncomfortable with her entering a room where he didn't think she was expected. Hillis, not wishing to enter into an argument, passed on, thoughtfully overcoming her irritation. There was something deep beneath that equanimity, and she pondered how quickly family relations might break down. A few seconds, and Diego's worried look made her realize that she was still a stranger in her new home. Hillis didn't even turn around, but Diego was insistent, demanding that her daughter stop. After the third order, she finally turned, meeting her father's gaze. Calmly and without the slightest fear in her voice, she said, Why should I stop? 
These words startled Diego, and he remained momentarily surprised and slightly embarrassed. Hillis went on, looking straight into her father's eyes, announcing that, according to the generally accepted rule, when someone orders a stop, it is usually customary to give a reason. And now she was waiting for that very reason. At that moment there was silence in the room, tense with the expectation of an answer that would change the course of family relations. Diego expressed his indignation, asking how Hillis dared to insult him. However, in response, the girl simply turned around and walked away, saying that judging from his reaction, he wasn't ready to have a conversation. She advised him next time to think about the topic of conversation before demanding that the man stop. In parting, she turned and dropped the phrase that if someone does not want to communicate, there is no point in provoking communication, thus emphasizing Diego's attitude towards her. This episode was another step in the process of Hillis's self-disclosure and assertion of her independence within the Anoadan family. Diego was furious at such behavior of Hillis. However, Ricardo, realizing that the situation was getting out of control, tried to calm his father. He said that Hillis was still emotional from yesterday and her behavior could be forgiven. Ricardo even suggested that his father join him in the dining room to take his mind off the unpleasant scene. However, when they entered the dining room, they saw that Diego's food had already been eaten. This angered the father even more, and he demanded that Hillis be brought to him. The situation in the Inouyden household became increasingly tense, and the drama continued to develop in unexpected directions. While Hillis was lying on her bed thinking that she had overeaten, her personal maid burst into her room, ready to wake her mistress. However, seeing that Hillis was awake, May was greatly surprised. Their gazes crossed, and in that moment the difference in status was noticeable. Despite the difference in social status between Hillis and May, the maid saw Hillis as a mere common man. She treated her with disdain, accustomed to the hierarchy that dictated her rules. But Hillis, aware of her position, knew that in the bowels of the castle, May could still be of use to her. Hillis, showing her determination, demanded that May bring her water for washing. This unexpected demand surprised the maid, but she went grudgingly to do her mistress's bidding. When May brought the water, her displeasure was evident in the way she set the basin on the floor with such force that the water scattered, even getting on Hillis's feet. The incident enraged Hillis, and in a second the water from the basin was already flowing toward May in response to her outrage. A small conflict erupted in the room, reflecting the complex relationships in the Inouyden household. May always saw Hillis as just a depressed girl who apologized to the maid for waking up late. She imagined Hillis as someone who had no luck in life, and apologizing for her unfortunate plight became a regular ritual. When May was assigned as a maid to Hillis, she initially thought her fate had turned its back on her. However, then, the sight of the superior aristocrat taking on the role of a snake in the castle pleased May. She found that working for Hillis was quite easy, and this unexpected variable in her life began to seem less miserable. However, it was time for a change, and May found herself in front of Hillis, demanding an explanation for her actions. Hillis, maintaining a monotone tone, began to reprimand the maid. She voiced her displeasure at May's inability to handle even such a simple task as fetching water for washing. Hillis reproached May for the icy water and added that such failures could cost the maid dearly. Hillis then stood tall with her head held high, emphasizing her arrogant posture and declared that if such incidents became known in the house, she would be punished. This threatening statement created tension between mistress and maid, and Hillis did not hesitate to use her high position in the Inouyden family. May was shocked, looking at the girl who only yesterday had seemed defenseless and docile to her, and today had become a true mistress. It was an abrupt turn of events for her, and she realized that Hillis's role in the Inouyden house had given her an unassailable status. Hillis, maintaining her calm manner, noticed May's shock and said that she would not have an easy time finding a new home if she were kicked out for such a misdemeanor. She then ordered the maid to leave, warning that she could even have her hands chopped off for such offenses. This moment emphasized Hillis's ruthless attitude toward those who did not meet her high standards. May, realizing her position, bowed her head in submission and apologized to her mistress. Hastily, she left to correct her mistake and prepare new water for washing. As Hillis washed her face, she reflected on how May, who had meekly accepted her orders, had clearly picked up on the change in her character. 
Mistress was pleased that Hillis's new role was making the whole relationship easier and more manageable. These reflections emphasized her desire for control and confidence in her power in the Inouyadan house. Suddenly, Hillis ran to her closet and noted disappointedly that her closet contained only dull clothes, remembering that only Gabrielle had all the pretty clothes. This moment emphasized the disparity between the sisters in the Inouyadan lineage. Rather than wallow over the limited selection in her closet, however, Hillis was determined that it no longer mattered. With a smile on her face, she turned all of her skimpy dresses into rose petals and ordered May to clean up. This episode emphasized her ability to find the bright side even in situations that seemed to be a disappointment. At this moment, the servants appeared, announcing that Diego was summoning his daughter to him. To this, however, Hillis surprised the servants by her resolute disposition and answered them that if her father had a talk with her, he must come himself. May, in a panic, began restlessly asking her mistress why Diego was making her angry. At that moment, the door slammed, creating a tense atmosphere in the room. The unexpected call from her father had raised excitement in Inouyden Castle, and Hillis was preparing to confront Diego to resolve the unpleasant situation. Diego burst into the room, yelling at Hillis that he had been holding back all these moments only because of Ricardo's pleas to leave her alone. There was a long-lasting indecision in his voice, built up and ready to explode. Hillis glanced at her father and grinned, causing more anger in his eyes. Ricardo, sensing the rising tension, had to intervene, holding his father by the sleeve to prevent a possible confrontation. Tension was evident in the room, and questions between father and daughter hung in the air, waiting to be resolved. Ricardo exploded, yelling at Hillis that she should apologize to her father. He reminded her of the incident in the dining room and expressed his resentment, pointing out that if Hillis had decided to eat breakfast in the dining room, she should have waited until her father arrived. In response to these words, Hillis coldly stated that if she sat down at the table with him, she would lose her appetite and she did not need it. Her determination and lack of willingness to comply created a new round of tension between daughter and father, and Ricardo faced the difficult task of mediating between them. His father could not put up with such insolence, and he emphatically stated that he was not going to give in even before Ricardo's pleas. At that moment, however, Hillis began to swirl her magical vines around father, creating a mysterious and fascinating spectacle. Hillis pondered at this time, realizing that perhaps Ricardo was just trying to diffuse her guilt over the incident in the garden. As she continued to hover around, Diego voiced his displeasure, stating that he hadn't taught Hillis such insolence. Family drama and magical elements created a strange but fascinating cocktail at Inouyadan Castle. Hillis suddenly rose from her seat, saying that her father hadn't really taught her such behavior. Diego sighed with relief, seeing that his daughter seemed to agree with his point of view. Approaching her father, Hillis said in characteristic fashion that the reason Diego had not taught her chutzpah was that he had taught her nothing at all. This point emphasized her sense of independence and her willingness to stand up to authority figures of her own kind. The situation at the castle was becoming increasingly complex, and further developments promised even more family secrets and internal strife. Once upon a time, Diego had chosen the lady of his heart over true love and a marriage of convenience— but the shadow of the past would not let him go, and he could not forgive Hillis for the fact that her birth had paid for the life of his beloved. This tragic story left unresolved questions and feelings in his father's heart. Five years later, Diego again ventured into marriage, this time to a woman who strongly resembled Hillis's mother. With this union, Hillis and Ricardo were joined by their stepmother and gained a new sister, Gabrielle. This created even more complications in the dynamics of the Inouyadan family where past and present were intertwined in a tangled pattern of family relationships. The couple, the embodiment of refined elegance and mysterious attractiveness, burst into the everyday atmosphere, instantly capturing the attention of others. The stepmother and stepsister brought a touch of incomparable grace and style to the gray routine, their gazes were like mysterious constellations that attracted the eyes, and their smiles were like elegant jokes that spread a whirlwind of excitement around them. But Hillis, in spite of her admiration, found herself on the very outskirts of this whirlwind of glitter and charm. The incomprehensible distance between her and the mysterious couple seemed to create an invisible wall that was hard to overcome. 
It was not a simple estrangement, but rather as if she had been deprived of a pass card to the world of glitter and splendor that opened up before the others. In the mirror of the world reflected in the window, Hillis saw Gabrielle rushing toward her father. Her heart sank with alarm. Anxiety clenched her heart, remembering how often her father had expressed his displeasure at her proximity. For every time she dared to touch his world, her father's disapproving gaze reminded her of her failures. But to her surprise, the scene unfolding before Hillis was far from her fears. Instead of a stormy expression of indignation, her father embraced Gabrielle with genuine joy. At that moment, Hillis felt a mixture of amazement and embarrassment, a new chapter of hope awakening in her soul. Hillis's gaze froze and surprise took her breath away. A sudden picture unfolded before her of her father embracing his half-sister with joy, something utterly unimaginable. Her gaping mouth served almost as a chronicle of this incredible moment. This turn of events inevitably metamorphosed in her soul the memories of her father's contemptuous gaze accompanying her every glance in his direction. That gaze, like a stigma, remained in her mind, a reminder of unwelcome touch and rejection. Hillis's gaze became a cold reflection of the shattered, perfect image. The truth cried out in her heart. Gabriel had taken the place Hillis had always dreamed of occupying. The family, vaguely resembling the picture of happiness she had seen in Diego and Gabrielle, pushed Hillis aside, making her a stranger in her own home. Monotonously, but bitterly, Hillis sounded her statement to her father. She was not accusing, but rather raising the question of justice. Her bad manners became a mirror that reflected her pain and frustration. She pointed to the root of the problem, the fact that she had not been shown how to be good. And in this... Her accusation carried the art of moment-to-moment -moment control of feelings. Diego, like a sudden thunderous wind, blasted his questions at Hillis. He dared to draw out the incident in the garden from the past, shaking the dark shadows from her memory. The words about the strength of their lineage, despite the absence of red hair, became like a thunderous warning in the middle of a simmering conflict. Hillis maintained a phlegmatic gaze as she met Diego's every word, her pink hair, which broke the perfect uniformity, was a testament not only to her strangeness, but also to the mystery she carried within. The encounter with the past, with uncharted forces, was part of an incredible investigation into her own blossoming. Diego confidently asserted that Hillis's blossoming was merely Ricardo's panicked reaction to Ricardo's fear for her safety. He insisted that Hillis keep these secrets to herself, as if words could drown out the thunderous jealousy of the family past. Hillis, like a shadow, turned and headed for the window, unmoved by the whirlwind of emotions developing in the room. Her voice was as cold as the winter wind as she belted out her words, saying that she was not going to obey her father's selfish instructions. She nonchalantly stated that Ricardo had no prime as if questioning the very fact that he existed. Diego, intoxicated with indignation, tried to regain his position of authority, but Hillis, mastering herself, asked with icy calmness how he intended to deal with her after this exchange of words. There was no fear in her words, only confidence in his superiority. She emphasized that killing her was the only thing her father was capable of doing to escape his own discomfort. Hillis, as if opening long-forgotten pages of her destiny, listed before Diego and Ricardo not only the threats of murder, but also the shadows of past lives, where they applied to her flogging and locking her in a room. In their ignorance lies the mystery of her return to the past, reliving her life for the eighth time. She stood on the window and told her father that her fall would prove an awakening, for it was because of the bloom that she would remain completely unharmed or the opposite could happen if there was no bloom, and asked her father, which outcome do you wish? Hillis's leap from the windowsill sounded like a thunderstorm, and for a moment the frozen world began to spin again. Ricardo's eyes flew up fearfully, while Diego's face remained unperturbed in spite of what was happening. The silence in the room was broken by the whisper of the wind bringing unknown limes. Diego looked out the window and found Hillis on the ground, surrounded by rose petals. The calmness on his face broke. His gaze slid across the landscape where Hillis lay seemingly lifeless, but was in fact unharmed. It was the moment he realized that her blossoming had actually made her unharmed, providing a new twist in their complicated story. One of the roses, as if sensing the gravity of the moment, jabbed directly at Hillis's cheek, as if trying to comfort the girl with its delicate petals. 
Hillis, lying among the petals, stared intently at the dumbfounded faces of Diego and Ricardo. In her eyes flashed the reflections of the past, when they had first encountered her awakening in her first life. She wondered if their faces had been just as full of surprise, fear, and incomprehension. In her first life, the news of her awakening had sounded like a thunderclap. Then Hillis had been foolish and weak, lacking the strength to assert her individuality. She had apologized to her father, bowing to his authority, promising to give strength back to her brother, the only one who could blossom in their generation. It was a time when Hillis had not yet realized her true strength, and her steps were obscured by paternal influence. Over time, she had outlived her foolishness and weakness by standing up to injustice and encroaching on those family secrets that had remained in the shadows for so long. At these words, Hillis, now standing in the shelter of her room, met Diego's angry gaze. His cry that he would have taken the power from her by now and given it to Ricardo if he had only known how pierced the air, leaving a dark cloud over the family relationship. Under the oppression of her father's order, Hillis found herself locked in her room, leaving it only for obligatory moments. Diego concentrated all his efforts on finding a way to solve this problem that had become a curse for the Inoidans. But the more time passed, the harder it became to find a way out of this maze of family secrets. Rumors in the noble society spread faster than the wind, and mocking talk began to appear among the other noble families. The power awakening in the Inoadan family became an object of irony, as if it was delayed in time, causing them to become an object of ridicule. In the end, Diego, in an effort to protect the family's reputation, decided to go to the extreme. He chose to lie, officially announcing to the public that Ricardo had experienced an awakening of his power. In that false version of events, Hillis became just a shadow of her brother, secretly using her power instead of him. Diego's decision was an act of desperation, an attempt to save the honor of the family, but at the same time condemning Hillis to shadows and lies. The public declaration took on a tinge of tragedy, for beneath the mask of false harmony lurked real anguish and the struggle for survival within the walls of this noble house. The day Hillis lost control of her power during a demonstration of Ricardo's awakening, the world around her began to spin like a whirlwind of mishaps. Her unstable condition ruined the choreography of the planned performance, and she paid a heavy price for it. Diego, furious with anger, dragged her by the hair like a prisoner and struck her as if each blow were punishment for her mistake. Her father's eyes reflected frustrated rage. He accused her of not only undermining the public's confidence, but also of tearing away the Inoadan family's veil of social nobility. Diego's words fell on Hillis like a hammer, accompanied by an order to lock herself up, depriving her of even the possibility of extinguishing her thirst. The lock on the door became a symbol not only of imprisonment, but also a silent sentence to her further humiliation. After the beating and merciless punishment of Hillis, the thought that she had brought shame to her brother Ricardo never left her. She felt an obligation to go and apologize to him, putting some shadow on the wall of his reputation. Coming out of her dark seclusion, Hillis faced a strict prohibition from Gabrielle. She declared that Hillis should stay in her room, as her presence could ruin the mood of everyone. Hillis, feeling the burden of her sinful presence, immediately apologized and promised to obey the order. While waiting for Ricardo's return, Hillis stood at the entrance, gazing into the distance as if she were searching for answers to her inner questions. Behind her, she could hear the unpleasant conversations of the maids, who assumed that Hillis was just trying to get her brother's attention. Unwilling to engage in confrontation, Hillis silently retreated toward the stairs. Here, in solitude, she was considering plans for her apology to Ricardo. She wanted to believe that his arrival would be as soon as possible so that she could finally apologize to him and try to regain some of his trust. Ricardo did not appear until well into the night, and during that time, Hillis's body refused to serve her. She felt that she had fallen unluckily when her father had scolded her, and at that moment her self-abasement only increased. Her brother had returned, but his return was far from what she had expected. Ricardo, being drunk, walked past Hillis as if she were part of an invisible world. This disappointment prompted her to think that perhaps it was not surprising that he drowned his pains in alcohol, pains caused by her presence. Hillis, filled with regret and ready to reconnect with her brother, ran up to Ricardo to apologize for what had happened. 
She promised to train harder so she wouldn't bring him any more shame. Her eyes read sincerity and eagerness to make up for her mistakes. However, Ricardo, instead of accepting the apology, began to accuse her of doing it on purpose to make fun of him. His words were like a blow to Hillis's heart. Response to her sincere attempts to repair the relationship, he only let her go, stating that he was in no mood to look at a lowlife like her. Trying to hold on to Ricardo, Hillis faced the bitter reality of his indifference. Her brother had simply struck her, throwing her down the stairs as if she were a mere shadow of his presence. As she flew down, she could still feel hope for his intervention, but Ricardo just stood there and watched her fall. This moment came to symbolize her own downfall, both physically and emotionally. The brother who was supposed to be a support became a source of pain and betrayal. Ricardo, watching her, did not show an ounce of compassion. Thus ended the first life of Hillis, unassuming and stupid. Her death, caused by the betrayal of her brother, was the last act in this tragic play of her fate. Hillis's stunt, which ended in a fall from a window, was not only a tragedy for the house of Inoadin, but also a source of unrest in noble society. The news of the incident spread instantly, becoming a topic of conversation among the servants and nobles. Rumors of the secret of the awakening, previously closely guarded by the Inouyden family, were now bubbling through the public space like a waterfall. Christian Farinan, noticing a potential weakness, decided to gather his forces and pay a visit to the Inouyden home. It was an omen of a new round of intrigue and danger for the noble family. The faces of Diego and Ricardo, who walked with grim expressions, spoke of the fact that the shadows of the past and the secrets of the family were now out in the open, and they would have to face the consequences of their own dark secrets. Gabrielle, not wanting to give in to the heavy atmosphere, decided to take the initiative. She resolutely went to Hillis, who was sleeping outside after her tragic fall, and started a conversation trying to bring some light into this gloomy moment. During the conversation, Gabrielle expressed her displeasure that Hillis didn't visit her when she was sick. In reality, she was just sad after the garden incident. However, instead of chiding Hillis, Gabrielle decided to go see her herself, realizing that it was important to support each other at that moment. Gabrielle, eager to share her feelings of resentment, was confronted with a murderous look from Hillis that silenced her. That unyielding gaze tore her from her thoughts and made her feel an unusual tension in the air. Hillis, usually willing to apologize for her actions, held her pride high at this moment. Gabrielle was shocked by this unaccustomed behavior because in a normal situation, Hillis would probably have apologized for making Gabrielle look for her herself. This time, however, Hillis surprisingly changed her usual course of action. In an attempt to diffuse the tension, Gabrielle mentioned that Christian was coming soon, so she dressed up. She even wore the pendant that Christian had given her. That precious accessory, which Hillis had previously described as beautiful, had been chosen with care and attention. Gabrielle, wanting to lighten the mood and bring lightness to the conversation, suggested that Hillis try on the pendant. The gesture was an attempt to connect and return to the times when the two sisters found joy in simple moments and beauty in the exchange of precious things. Hillis is faced with a choice, knowing that even a small pendant can cause a flurry of problems. She dismisses the idea of wearing it because she knows full well that at that moment Gabrielle will begin her theatrical scene of accusations. Even the thought of it irritates Hillis. She wishes that Gabrielle would stop being so annoying for just a moment. Sisterhood is a real challenge for Hillis, and every time Gabrielle starts her antics, she feels a storm of resentment raging in her soul. Gabrielle, with a smile, held out the pendant as if disguising her intentions as a friendly action. She spoke of helping to clasp it, as if in this small act of kindness lurked the key to everything. But Hillis, lying on the grass, recoiled from this suggestion as if it were an invasion of her privacy. Get lost, you're blocking my son, Hillis said curtly, feeling the irritation rippling in her voice. Gabrielle was left puzzled at such a harsh response, not expecting such a reaction from her sister. But Hillis was not about to give in. At that moment, magical vines erupted around her as if in response to her inner rage. Spontaneously rising from the ground, they enveloped Gabrielle, causing her to hang upside down. Gabrielle screamed in surprise and helplessness, like a bird caught in a net. Under the dazzling light of the sun, at the moment Gabrielle was begging for mercy, Christian appeared on the horizon. Hillis, like an artist creating his work, 
was struck by the admiration in his eyes. Christian, unabashedly enjoying the spectacle, did not conceal his delight at what was happening. His admiration was like the light of a ray at this moment when Gabriel was helplessly praying for mercy. When Gabriel noticed Christian's appearance, she lit up like a ray of sunshine. She perked up, exuding an enchanting mixture of charm and joy. When she asked for Christian's help, she delicately reminded him of her situation. Christian, ignoring Gabrielle's requests, knelt down in front of Hillis. His attention was completely absorbed by the fact that a noble had blossomed before him, and he felt the greatness of the moment. As if witnessing the beginning of a great period, he recognized the uniqueness of the power that had just blossomed in Hillis. Even though I thought Ricardo would bloom, your awakening, Hillis, has exceeded all expectations. No roses would have suited anyone as well as you, Christian pronounced like a poet whose words bloom on the pages of time. As he touched Hillis's icy hair, he recognized her as the new mistress of roses, whose power was manifested at this moment. Admiration sparkled in his eyes, and he delicately emphasized that to him this was not merely a chance meeting, but an honorable introduction to one who would bear this great hereditary gift. Christian's sudden invitation to make the journey to Farvenin came as an unpleasant surprise to Hillis. She met it with indifference, as if the proposed world had no special meaning for her. But the moment Christian put his arm around Hillis, Gabrielle's shrieks pierced the air. She demanded that Christian take his hands off her sister, as if she wanted to protect Hillis from the wizard's intrusiveness. However, as if in response to her scream, the vines holding her suddenly relaxed, freeing Gabriel from their magical shackles. Suddenly, Gabrielle whipped Christian's hand away and headed toward the manor. Her determination was like a whirlwind that carried through moments of misunderstanding like the excitement before a storm. Christian, stunned by this turn, stared at his hand as if it had just pushed him away from the gates of a mysterious kingdom. He came to his senses and ran after Hillis, as if trying to catch up with a runaway train. Christian rushed after Hillis, but her determination was so great that she created a wall of roses closing the way behind her. The roses rose like living guards around her, creating an impenetrable barrier. In a moment of sudden embarrassment, Christian wondered if the character might change with the awakening of the ability. It seemed to him that Hillis had always had to like him, but now, in the light of her new powers, he began to doubt it. There was a wrong feeling in his voice, as if Hillis's magic vines had created not only a wall of roses but a rift in his self-confidence. The man with whom Christian was conversing suggested that he turn his attention to Mrs. Gabrielle, pointing out that she had just been badly hurt. He should have approached and comforted her, for there was a look of grief on her face and her tears reflected her pain. They both looked at the weeping Gabrielle whose suffering seemed irreversible. Only the servants were at her side, expressing their concern. However, the man pointed out that Christian should have been there, for Gabrielle was his bride. In that moment, one felt the shadow of unspoken words and untold duties calling Christian to show care and attention to the one who was to be his destiny. Christian, taking the rose frozen by his magic, replied that there was no need to worry about Gabrielle anymore. He proclaimed that he had already found his true gem. At that moment, it was as if a new note in this sensual symphony was sounded, where the rose became a symbol not only of magic, but also of the change in Christian's heart. Remembering her experiences, Hillis suddenly recalled the moment of her first rebirth, when she found herself back in the day when Gabrielle's monster had rampaged free. Those memories seemed to slowly pass before her eyes, and she couldn't believe that she was now alive again, in a world of change and magic, where every moment revealed new facets of destiny, Hillis felt the past and present intertwine in her marvelous traveling dance. In her second life, full of difficult choices and unpredictable twists and turns, Hillis found support in only one man. In the twilight of doubt, there was a reliable companion to bear the weight of the winter Favanon family. It was Christian, whose influence seeped into her life like a light in a dark room. Christian heir to the Winter family, brought an unwavering steadiness to the chaos of the Hillies. His eyes read not only family history but also the promise of support on an unpredictable journey. In the whirlwind of change, where doubt is like a thick fog, Christian became the epitome of resilience and determination, and Christian was also the man she was secretly in love with. Christian often dropped in on Hillis and his appearance became a kind of oasis in the gray of everyday life. He came not for the obligatory conversations, but simply to inquire how she was. 
However, even in those moments when their souls might have drawn closer together, Hillis remained unquestionably true to her principles because Christian was betrothed to her sister. Christian, like a temptation, opened his thoughts to Hillis, sharing how he saw the girl's family. It was as if he were unfolding the dark pages of their family, convincing her that she wasn't getting what she deserved. At moments of his conversations, Hillis felt his words like dark shadows enveloping her, making her feel abandoned in the world. Christian, like an artist, took a strand of Hillis's hair in his fingers, as if eager to unravel the mystery of this girl in every strand of them. This unexpected gesture was confusing, creating an invisible bond between them. At the moment of touching, Hillis's feelings were bubbling as if imprisoned in a confined room. Even in her second life, amidst the eighth act, Christian continued to amaze. His invitation to Farvanen sounded like an invitation to an enchanted world where reality merges with magic. This city was becoming a kind of illusory arc, inviting Hillis to see her world from a new perspective. Christian, like a knight in modern guise, claimed that his desire to protect Hillis came from a deep sense of responsibility. He spoke of his determination to address her outrages, especially in the context of his engagement to Gabrielle. His words sounded not only caring, but also a clear understanding that the threads of their fates were intertwined by familial obligations. In response to Hillis's objections to Gabrielle, Christian emphasized that the decision to get engaged was not solely within his power. His words, like magic words of a spell, deprived Hillis of the illusion of control over her destiny. Then, in the fires of inner reflections, Hillis felt for the first time that she could be greedy, if only for a moment. In this world where reality intertwined with dreams, she decided to savor every moment, whether it was a reality or a dream. Life, like a sweet fruit, invited her to plunge into the whirlwind of events and taste freedom in this complex weave of fate. Christian, like a visionary, urged Hillis to forget about the rest of the world and focus her eyes and heart solely on him. His words, like hypnotism, for a time calmed her inner rebellion and created an illusion of security. At that moment, seized by this indefinable magic, she gave in and grasped his hand as if it were the last saving rod. As time passed, however, she realized that it had been one of the stupidest decisions she had ever made. By limiting her vision to Christian, she had lost sight of the many nuances of the world around her. Back at the secluded estate, Hillis felt the memories of old lives hovering around her like shadows of the past. And in those tiny fragments of time, the image of Christian, the first person to be at her side when her powers were just beginning to blossom, would resurface. This ritual, repeated in each of her lives, became a kind of beacon in time. Christian, like fate in human form, would find her after her powers had awakened. He became the first witness to her blossoming, and, as a kind of guardian, began to take care of her. Now realizing her uniqueness and role in the long Farvanen line, Hillis understood that in each past incarnation, Christian had sought not only her, but the power contained in her potential. This natural cycle of courtship and care was evolving into a pattern where marrying her was not just a union of two hearts, but a strategic move to strengthen the ancient Farvanen line. Hillis, back at her secluded estate, felt an inner need for comfort, and her hungry stomach reminded her that it was time to turn to May, her faithful personal maid. With a slight wave of her hand, she beckoned to May, expressing her need for food. May responded in a silky voice, promising to take care of the food and relay the order to the cook. Hillis couldn't help but smile as she saw how quickly and deftly May had transformed herself, becoming silky yet so professional in her duties. Suddenly, at that moment, Ricardo, the brother of Hillis and Gabrielle, appeared in an apparent state of agitation. He began yelling at Hillis, accusing her of attacking her sister in the garden. Ricardo's looks and words poured out in a storm of emotion, causing the manor to fill with tension. With a muffled creak of the door, Ricardo entered Hillis's room and his footsteps froze on the threshold, as if the past had suddenly burst into the present. In a flash of recollection, he remembered how his sister had leaped out of the window this morning with ease, displaying her astounding abilities. Thus, before the scene of sisterhood that had appeared in his memory, Ricardo, as if shifting his attention, had stopped shouting. Calmly turning to Hillis, he expressed his interest in what had happened between her and Gabrielle. The jump from the third floor that presented her unique abilities seemed to have left a mark on Ricardo's soul making him approach the situation in a more measured and unemotional manner. He seemed determined to avoid such impulsiveness in Hillis's behavior, 
which seem to have the potential to overturn the perception of ordinary reality in this house. Hillis, her voice firm, said that she hadn't attacked anyone, but had merely pulled Gabrielle away from her because she seemed to be getting on her nerves on purpose. Those words which rang through the silence of the room like a sword drove Ricardo out of his mind. He shouted at Hillis in rage, accusing her of indifference and aggression without taking her side and arguments into account. Ricardo's air-shattering shout began to sound like a thunderbolt shattering the silence. These words, full of accusation and anger, were a reminder that behind every perception of events, there is a different perspective and truth. Ricardo, having witnessed the scene, had brought his own piece to the puzzle of family relations, and now his emotions were boiling like a cauldron throwing its gurgles outward. The whirlwind of emotions didn't subside, and Ricardo continued to voice his concern, shouting about how Gabrielle was very frightened, even crying. His voice filled the space, as if it embodied the storm that had erupted inside. Hillis reacted to these words with surprising calmness, stating that a situation where someone was frightened or even crying could not be called an assault. Her tone was confident that her action was motivated by the need to protect herself, not by a desire to cause suffering to another. This response, though terse, conveyed her clear opinion of what had happened, as if Hillis stood on the firm ground of her convictions. Hillis, in response to Ricardo's words that their ideas of attack differed as if to emphasize her words, swung the vines at her brother in a moment of determination. The branches, as if blossoming in anger, hovered in the air, framing a picture of family conflict. Moments later, the room bore witness to an internal storm as Ricardo found himself sitting on the floor, the broken wall now a metaphor for a broken relationship. Blood trickled down his cheek like a drop of reality in a world of illusion. At that moment, the grim branches of the vines slowly subsided as if after a storm, leaving behind a trail of destruction and pain. Once more, Ricardo shouted menacingly, like a thunderbolt tearing the silence as he swore and accused Hillis of madness. His eyes flickered with displeasure and disappointment, as if at that moment he saw before him the incomprehensible. In response to this whirlwind of emotions, Hillis calmly stated that she simply thought that ordinary words would not be able to convey to him the meaning of what had happened. Her reply was like a light breeze that carried irony and equanimity. In that moment, she seemed to lift the curtain of her own unusual reality, leaving behind a mystery of an inner world that not everyone could understand. Hillis bent over her brother, gently wiped the blood from his face. In that moment, as their worlds intertwined in a family conflict, she spoke words mixed with concern and severity. She said that if her attack had been directed at Gabriel, the latter would not have gotten away with it so easily, and at least one drop of blood would surely be spilled. With a sad expression on his face, Ricardo said that if he hadn't turned around, he might not have survived the lunge. In those words was the realization of the risk and the storm of feelings that might have erupted if not for his attention and reaction. So the moment of family drama had pierced them both, leaving behind a trail of misunderstanding and perhaps even regret. Ricardo, driven by adrenaline and anger, asked Hillis if she wouldn't care if he got hurt. There was not only concern in that question, but something more, a sense of vulnerability in the shadow of a family tragedy. However, Hillis, realizing the irony of the situation they were in, simply jumped, as if expressing her dissatisfaction with the irrationality of everything that was happening. This short reaction, filled with irony, was like a mirror reflecting their intertwined fates, where even the traumas of the past influenced the present. And perhaps in that moment she realized that their history was full of paradoxes and difficult questions that didn't always have answers. Instead of answering her brother's question, Hillis simply called out to May. This moment, devoid of words, was a blow to Ricardo's heart. His eyes were dumbfounded, and in that mute confusion he stared at Hillis, unable to find words to describe the confusion of feelings. Hillis, as if ignoring her brother's gaze, was ordering May to prepare the new room. The maid, who had witnessed the entire altercation, nodded quickly in submission and assurance, saying that everything would be done instantly. In this continuous pause, full of tension and expectation, it seemed that the air was filled with untold emotions, and the next step in this family drama remained in great doubt. Gabrielle, upon hearing the news of Hillies' room change, was greatly annoyed. 
She asked Hillies why she had done it, especially since she had a nice room that was even on the same floor as Gabrielle herself. The question sounded not only frustration, but also some bewilderment at Hillies' decisions. The maid in turn told Gabrielle about Hillis's attack on Ricardo, and the message caused Gabrielle to panic. Her mind flashed back to that bitter story when Gabrielle's complaints had been the reason Ricardo had turned his attention to Hillis. Now, learning of the new developments, Gabrielle seemed to feel the weight of responsibility for what was happening and the consequences of her actions. Gabrielle, expecting the standard development of events, assumed that Ricardo would simply scold Hillis, and their sister would humbly apologize. However, the reality turned out to be far from her expectations, and Gabrielle was shocked by what was happening. In a rush of emotion, Gabrielle began to shake the maid as if trying to get the truth out of her. She was eager to know if what she had said about the attack was true. But the maid, despite the pressure, only repeated that the wall in Hillis's room could not have collapsed by itself. At this moment of collision between feeling and reality, Gabrielle felt the ground slipping away from under her feet and the puzzle of events becoming more and more complex. Suddenly there was a loud clang in the silence and Gabriel, frightened by the rapid change in Hillis's behavior, clamped her ears in panic, hastily considering it as her sister. In her mind's eye, she expected chaos and more displays of strange behavior. When Gabriel looked out the door, however, she found her father standing in the middle of the hallway, right in front of a wall of roses. This beautiful wall of roses, as if created by magical hands, made Gabrielle momentarily forget all her worries and panic. Each flower seemed like a work of art, created out of pure love for the beauty of nature. In that moment, magic and reality merged into one harmony, and Gabrielle couldn't help but marvel at this magic. Gabrielle, stunned by the beauty of the wall of roses, couldn't help but wonder if it was the work of their father, Diego. To her surprise, he confirmed that the magic wall was the result of his work and explained that he couldn't tolerate any further mischief from Hillis, which was why he'd decided to block the hallway. Diego assured Gabrielle that she could now be at ease. However, standing in this renewed environment, the girl wondered if there might be something important on the other side of the corridor, now inaccessible to her. The mystery of this new space caused some anxiety in her soul and a desire to unravel the mysteries hidden behind the wall of roses. Suddenly Gabrielle blurted out that on the other side of the wall was the dress she had recently bought and was going to wear to Calicia's upcoming ball. This unexpected detail put a new twist on her perception of the situation. While Gabrielle lamented the possibility that Hillis might tear her long-awaited dress, Diego disappointedly pointed out that Ricardo had been injured and she shouldn't worry about any outfit. But Gabrielle, undeterred, parried, claiming that she'd heard that Ricardo had only a scratch. In this confrontation between the desire to maintain a perfect appearance and the reality of pain and anxiety, the deep contradiction within Gabrielle was apparent. Gabrielle responded to the allegation of scratches by saying that such minor injuries were easily treated and, in fact, it was normal for brother and sister to fight sometimes. Her words sounded like an attempt to resolve the tense situation, and put her in a positive mood. At this time, however, Diego remembered how Gabrielle had brought Christian into the house despite the ban on outsiders. That moment reminded him of her defiance and determination to break the rules. He decided that this time he would not tolerate her bad behavior and raised his voice and shouted that he would not change his mind. In that shout, there was not only severity, but also some pain and frustration that his instructions were being ignored. Diego, emphasizing his determination, said that he wasn't going to let Gabrielle go to the ball anyway, and therefore her dress was useless, and after making his statement, he left. Gabrielle was greatly surprised that this was the first time her father had gotten angry with her, for this had never happened before. At that moment, she realized that something had changed in their normal dynamic, and she was in a new, unpredictable situation. Standing in front of the Wall of Roses, May and Hillis were dumbfounded as they looked around the enclosed space. Even the windows were blocked, and the wall of roses was not only a beautiful decoration, but also a kind of symbol of their isolation. Suddenly, despite the circumstances, Hillis asked the maid when Kalisha's ball would finally take place, as if trying to maintain some normality in this strange and unpredictable world. Hearing that Kalisha's ball would be held in three days, Hillis, yawning, simply drifted off to sleep 
telling May to take any available room and lie down too. Her calm attitude to the fact that they were locked in was surprising, as if Hillis retained her sanity even in unusual circumstances. A May, on the other hand, was too surprised at the whole situation and at how carefree Hillis had made the decision to go to bed. Her eyes reflected bewilderment at her mistress's steadfastness and coolness, as if the situation in which they found themselves was familiar to her or at least expected. May was walking through the dark corridors, where the wall of roses kept out the sunlight and complaining that they were locked in for the third day. Her voice sounded filled with displeasure and bewilderment at how they were in this strange situation. Suddenly, however, as if something had surfaced in her mind, May cheered up. She cheerfully remarked that all this trouble and mysterious occurrences were worth something special. She found something in this unusual situation that made her see things differently. Mrs. Hillis had not exerted much pressure on May during the last few days, nor had she thrown the burden of work upon her. Food was always brought to them, and the atmosphere in the house was more like a vacation than a confinement. Hillis behaved in an unusually peaceful and generous manner. May was free to use the bathroom, and in this sort of isolation, she even found time to try on a dress secretly intended for Mrs. Gabrielle. This unusual life of strange confinement was beginning to remind her not so much of confinement as of a kind of unexpected vacation full of surprising events and unbelievable circumstances. Suddenly, May stopped in place, illuminated by the lamp in her hands, and a realization flashed in her eyes. Today was the Kalisha Ball. That moment filled the air with anticipation and excitement. Just as the Inoaden family faithfully cares for Mrs. Gabrielle, the Kalikia family cares for their precious daughter with awe as a true princess. And tonight, there will be a ball in honor of the princess's birthday. May couldn't help herself and chuckled caustically at the fact that Lady Gabrielle had been denied the opportunity to attend the ball. She imagined Lady Gabrielle's reaction to the news, enjoying her schadenfreude. In addition, she noted that Mr. Ricardo would also be unable to attend due to his injury, which meant that Mr. Diego would be going to the ball alone. However, when May brought food for Hillis and entered the room, she was met with a sudden and disturbing sight. The window was broken and Hillis herself was missing. This unexpected turn of events added more mystery and suspense to the atmosphere. Hillis stood on the roof of a random house, her gaze directed toward the sunset. The tranquility of the evening disposed her to reflection. Then she cheerfully began to leap across the rooftops, moving forward with ease and grace. Today, in honor of the birthday of the precious princess of the Kalikia family, Hillis decided to prepare a special gift for her. This gesture of tenderness and care welcomed a new day in their mysterious life, full of secrets and exciting events. Hillis walked confidently through the corpse-strewn building, ignoring the blood and screams around her. Her eyes were focused on one thought. He was already here. Despite the horrors around her, Hillis moved forward as if an unshakable force was leading her to her goal. A crowd opposed her, speaking of a certain tormentor, trying to instill their faith and fear. In a moment, however, Hillis left no trace of that crowd, as if her presence was invisible to those who worshipped the unknown solemn being. With the same confidence with which she had gone forward, Hillis passed on, maintaining her purpose and determination in this strange and gloomy world. The Kalikia family, in their endeavor to preserve and strengthen their magical abilities, resorted to the practice of close alliances. For a long time, this allowed them to remain the strongest family, inheriting magical talents from generation to generation. However, at some point, their magic suddenly disappeared, causing the Kalikia family to become known as the only one of the four ancient clans to lose its power. Suddenly deprived of what seemed to be eternal powers, family members searched for ways to regain their lost magical gifts. However, among them was a boy whose blood not only carried magical energy, but was also transformed into precious stones. He became like a goose laying golden eggs for his clan, becoming something valuable and unique in a world where the magic of the clans became the basis of their power and importance. So when Hillis approached the boy, he looked at her and asked if the god of death had come for him. Hillis remembered with a smile the past, seventh life, where the boy thought she was an angel giving him protection and comfort. However, in this, the eighth life, the reality was different. He saw her as the god of death. This contradiction created a mysterious harmony in their meeting, like the intertwining of destinies and roles in this boundless world.
The boy looked at Hillis and asked longingly if he was already dead. When he heard a negative answer, he suddenly grabbed hold of Hillis and, full of despair, asked her to put him out of his misery at last. His eyes were filled with pain and anguish, as if he wandered between worlds, caught between life and death, and his soul languished in this eternal contradiction.